Hey, what's going on, everybody? Michael with The Real 1%. Back at you guys and girls with another episode of Military to Civilian, uh, the ultimate game plan to success, the last assault, whatever you want to call it, your last mission. It's something that we've been trying to talk about lately and share our experiences. So I'm joined today with my new friend, Lisa. How are you doing today, Lisa? Hey, how are you, Mike? I'm doing well. I'm good. Thanks for joining me. In. Thanks for joining me today, and I uh, look forward to hearing your story. So we'll just dive into everything, and if you don't mind sharing to the listeners, what made you join the military? What branch of service did you join? And uh, let us know what what brought you to the point of thinking about getting out of the service, if you don't mind. Okay, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me, first no off. No problem. Uh, thanks for allowing me to share. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, I joined the military straight out of high school. I'm the youngest of six. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Okay. Uh, I had an older brother and an older sister who had already enlisted in the Air Force. And so for me, it seemed like a, a good choice. I knew I wasn't ready for college. I knew I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do as a career. Who wants to know what they want to do for the rest of their life? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was 17. My father had decided for me to go in. I think he did a little joyfully, too. I'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, so I did go into the military because for me, it was that's what was the option right then. I knew I couldn't find a job in Los Angeles where I could sustain myself. Right. So I went into the military, chose the Air Force because apparently my scores were getting up. Um, there you go. I went. And uh, I, I scored highest in administration and, you know, but I actually went into mechanical and I became an uh, aircraft mechanic. Okay. For, I was for cargo aircraft. Did you, do, did you pick that yourself? I didn't, but you know what? <laughs> okay. They made it look really, really glamorous. I swear what, to God, they, I know this they, is my they imagination. Do? Hype it up. <laughs> what they do? What they do? What they do? Listen. And I know this is my imagination. I'm exaggerating, but I swear there was some really nice video of people on the flight line with the San Bernardino mountains behind them and the sun setting and music and marshalling aircraft. I was like, yeah, this is what's up. And then they sent my black self to New Jersey. Oh, God. <laughs> From Los Angeles. Where, what, so what, base, I, what base was that at? At McGuire Air Force Base. It's next to Fort Dix in New Jersey. Okay. And I was not uh, acclimated to snow, cold weather, anything like that. I had a few falls when I first got there trying to dress cute like I was still in California wearing flat, slippery shoes. So many times I ended up on the ground. <laughs> you needed some Timberland boots or something like that. I yeah, needed some needed totally, Tim, totally different. But it was totally, it was, yeah, just the whole culture change just of being a high school kid and going into the military. Okay. Being a a woman in a male dominated career field. Just really that was mind blowing. Mind blowing. I yeah. expected to I don't know what I expected. I my brother who was in the Air Force was a uh, security police. Okay. My sister was supply. So I didn't have any background or real world knowledge or any history of what it was like to be in a maintenance quadrant as a woman in the 80s, sir, yeah. mind you. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Even so, now, it doesn't seem like there's that many. I mean, I got out in 2015. There was a few chicks and not a lot, but you know what I'm saying? Right, so absolutely. Right. That's, that's, yeah, it's crazy to put that into perspective and actually like look yeah. at like, here, I, here, you're st because you probably, sur you were like what one of the only probably, right? Very one of the very few, few one yeah. of the very few, yeah. And I started off in the inspection dock where I just, you know, walked wings and stuff like that and did refurbishment for whatever. And then working on the flight line, having to carry a toolbox and trying to trying to prove yourself. And I don't need your help. I can carry this toolbox. And blah, blah, blah. I'm as good as you guys are. It's it's all a mess anyway. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> just just the the blatant harassment okay physical verbal sexual harassment it was almost the norm and i'm only speaking from my experience i cannot yeah. speak for anyone else not for anyone else right but it was it was like an old boys club and the the idea of reporting someone who was being 
you know, inappropriate or whatever, reporting to someone above them, like talking to my first sergeant or something. And they would say, you know what? That was just a misunderstanding. You just took it wrong. Okay. Okay. okay they probably weren't, they probably weren't even used to working with women they were them either. Not. So it's like, so you, to, oh, that's crazy. They Think were not. So it was a whole thing for, not just for me, but for, for everyone. Right. But uh, I have some friends. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Los Angeles in August to see a friend of mine that I was in the military with, a female friend. Okay. Those, those friendships that I forged, we have been friends 35, almost 40 years. Yeah, those absolutely. Those same women who were in maintenance with me. Yeah. We have a story to tell. We, you know, encourage each other. While we were in there and doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you guys got plenty of stories, I'm sure. But no, that's and that's what I've told like my friends that I've served with. I'm like, man, by the time we get older, we're gonna know each other most of our life, you know? Absolutely. Like, so yeah, Absolutely. you're right. That's one of the best things of the military is you're gonna find those people in there, and you guys will be friends for the rest of your life. And, so and it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. So I stayed in the military for almost ten years. Here's here's the gag. <laughs> <laughs> In 1988, I was running on base. I fell into a sinkhole uh, that was left by the Army Corps of Engineers. It took half my leg, half my left leg. And I I heard it crack. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I broke my leg. But But when I came, when I crawled out this hole, and I mean, it just took my leg. It just, the ground just dropped. And I fell into it. So when I crawled out, I, I could not bear any weight on the leg, anything like that. It was I found somebody, because it was around the dorms. I lived in the dorms. So somebody did find me and come help me. Because, you know, back in those days, honey, we didn't have cell phones and all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm just there. So someone did come along and help me. They got me to uh, the ER. At that time, the hospital on Fort Dix was called Watson Hospital and the Army ran it at that time, just years ago. And I uh, went to the ER. They told me I sprained my knee. They said, you sprained your knee. I was like, but I can't feel my foot. I couldn't feel my left foot. Wow. Um, so I had to go back and forth to the Air Force Clinic that was one base for the next four or five days. They kept putting cast on it and da 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 I could bear no weight. I could not. It was It was bad. The pain was, yeah. And I've had three children. I can tell you that was pretty much the worst pain ever. Wow. Um, so mm-hmm. when they finally sent me to an ortho specialist at Watson, it, it, they came to realize they had to put me to sleep to examine my leg because it was that painful. They couldn't even touch it. I had torn my ACL, my PCL, and I had detached the back of the kneecap and damaged a nerve that runs down the leg. That's why my foot was numb. Meantime, the time you got a, a sprained knee. That's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. I don't even know. Like, if you don't know what, like, if you don't know what it is, you should just like send them out. You should have been out in like, Go to yeah. Walter Reed or go to go somewhere. Yeah, up on go East Coast somewhere there. because because we don't know what we're doing, and they kept putting yeah. casts on it. Yeah, like, that's crazy. It's, it's, and then the one person put a cast on it, and my leg was straight with the cast. And somebody came and asked him, "How's he supposed to go to the bathroom?" Her leg is straight. Right? It was just a whole mess. So I had an ortho surgeon. Oh. He looked at it. He was like, "Yeah, your knee is really, really bad, Tora." He said, "If you were the ar- in the army, we would just retire you because you're, you're you're bad." But here's what the Air Force did. Wow. I was I was a uh, four or five seven, which is aircraft maintenance, and at that time. It was a critical career field. It was difficult to find people to get in that field and keep people in it. Okay. Um, so instead of letting me, I tell you, I got a lot of gobbledygook and foolishness when I tried to talk to people and hire up and say, well, what should I do? You know. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, they're going to repair. They, re, um, they fixed the knee. They did. They had to repair a whole lot of stuff in there. And then after that, I was on a profile, of course, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I can't go on the flight line. I can't do it. So they had me sitting in an office doing some paperwork or whatever with my leg up. I'm on a profile. I was on a profile for so long. 
When I tell you long, okay, my, my thing happened in 1988. I didn't get out of the military to 1992. Okay. Yeah, but you got to have your whole knee reconstructed, essentially. So, like, you got to have a lot. Reconstructed it. Yeah, you got to yeah. have property. Yeah, that, that takes a long, long time. I mean. Oh, my well, God. The, people in the, the sports. Rehab. Yeah, you're gone for a whole year if you tore ACL. Yeah. Or that. You're gone a whole year if you tore your ACL, MCL, all that other stuff. You just said you might be out two years. I mean, they got a guy. A lot, yeah. Like, a guy in the, yeah, so that's. It's, I broke my foot when I was in Afghanistan. Something, well, I didn't hit a sinkhole, but I hit a lay. I tried to go up for a layup and came down and thought I broke my, uh, I thought I broke my ankle because I couldn't get up and oh, bear, wow. bear weight either. But it was my, my only my foot. But no, keep going. I want to, uh, so, so they yeah. pretty much try to have you put your foot up, fill out all the, uh, so all I'm the doing all my rehab and my physical therapy and da da da, but I never cross changed into anything else. I'm still a four, five, seven. Um, they even let me re-enlist while I was under that profile, that medical profile. Okay. Um, so at, at some point, it just got to where I realized and where I was hearing from the doctors, it's not going to get better. You yeah. need to be med boarded. It's not going to get better. You're you're still not going to be able to wear combat boots. You're, you're not going to be nothing. Right. So I, I, asked for, I had to ask for a medical board. They sent me to Texas, San Antonio. And I go, now, mind you, uh, the lawyer is there for the med board people. I don't have any representation. Yeah, this you're so new and foreign to me. I have no idea what's really going on. So the lawyer comes, I'm sitting in this waiting room, and the lawyer comes out and he says, you know. Now, this is the lawyer that works for the Air Force. Now, you know, they're probably just going to give you only a little bit, and you're not going to really get anything. They're not going to take care of you. So you might as well just Take this little severance and just move on. That was the advice. Oh, of and course. That's, that's a one-time payment instead of paying you for yes. the rest of your life. Of course. Yes. They're going to tell you on that dream. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, so like, how, did, what, how did you, how did you, what, what did that look like next? <laughs> Keep going. I don't even want to interrupt you. I'm just adding my little two cents, but you got to go in them. But God, I like it. Gotta, I like you gotta it. You got to love that. Uh, you got to love that. I like, like it. So, so I'm sitting in that little room where you, at the time I had two children, mind you. I have two kids. I can't stay in the Air Force. I don't know what to do. Uh, whatever. Okay, go ahead and take that little severance, Miss Ma'am, and you'll be okay. And just you figure it out. Whatever. They gave me, and I'm looking at it, twenty one thousand eight hundred and ninety one dollars and sixty cents okay. in severance, and they taxed it. Yeah, of course. They took anymore. a state side, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. What they <laughs> So they let me out and I had maybe I had a a ten percent disability as torn up as my leg was. Yeah, absolutely. And I still yeah. I still had foot drop because they couldn't uh they could not repair the nerve during the surgery. So I okay. still had foot drop, I had to wear AFO and all these kinds of things and just it tore me up. So I I'm getting out the military. There is no there was no mechanism at that time to help you transition. To say, okay, well, you should do this. The, the most I got was you need to fill out this paper, that paperwork, that paperwork. And at the time, I did not have the GI Bill because during that time, uh, the military was using that V thing. Yeah. That was a hot mess. <laughs> so that was a hot mess. So I didn't have the GI Bill. I had V. So I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I'm just scared. I need to try to take care of me and my kids and $20,000. It seemed like a lot of money at the time. Not even though, really. It yeah. is not. So I knew I didn't want to go back to Los Angeles with my children. At the time, I had two boys. I have three now. They're all grown. Okay. Um, I knew I didn't want to go back to Los Angeles with my children. So I moved down south uh, where I had one of my battle buddies that I had known. She was from here and she moved down. I, so I'll go there trying to get my footing and figure it all out or whatever. So I paid for rent for a whole year and did some other things. And, da, da, da. Um, could, and the, the small town that I was in, I could not find a job. First of all, there's this lie. Okay. Here's this lie. This is my own experience, my personal opinion. Yeah. People tell you, when you get out the military, honey, you're a veteran. Everybody will hire you. I don't know where that lie came from. No, that's not true. Some people <laughs> some people think you're a threat to a job if it's a certain job, so they won't even take you on that. A job that you think that you're oh, the, a job that you're just trying to get into to get paid, but you send them this crazy yes. resume and they're like, oh no. You know what I mean? They yes. tell you like 
So that's yeah, that is a myth. Don't think just because you're a veteran, you're want you're going to be hired because a lot of people don't care. And then people that you you're know, not special. You're you not. Know, no, really not. Mm -hmm. No, uh, not when it comes to the civilian world. I mean, you, you just you, none of that stuff matters. Like people were saying yesterday, like a ranger tab and a special forces tab and a, a sapper tab. Yeah, yeah that stuff yeah. can equate to a job because you have a network. But like, they don't really. You're not going to wear that stuff when you get out. So you're really not. You're not. Matter. And it's absolutely important that people understand that. Um, oh, you can go get a federal job, sweetie. It, it depends on where you are and where you live. These federal jobs aren't just flying out. You know, just lay it all around for you to go and pick up and right. really how and, and in that time when i got out i got out in 1992 in fact uh in july i will have been out of the military 31 years oh wow so when did you when, how, how long was there how long of a timeline did you have when they try to sh uh, sugar you up with that severance until you got out like you got that and then like <laughs> what you got out and like, did you not like what? And also, three part question, I guess. What would the disability okay. process look like back there? Like the VA? Did you guys even get to see a VSO before you departed the uh, Air Force? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. not. I never heard Maybe. of a VSO ever. Until ever. when? Until how long? Did, what that uh, look like? Well, I guess that's like a five what? part question. But I mean, go whichever way you want to go with it because. <laughs> That's, I know the I know it's been like you can look back and I mean a lot of you can tell there's been improvements. So obviously we're not here to like absolutely not absolutely we're just here to like put it stuff out in the open that like hey you know like wow you guys weren't even offered the same opportunity in what only right. like twenty years different twenty years time difference so not even right. you know so crazy right and so to put it into perspective once they offered me that severance it was just really a a, a few months. Months, they were like, man, I was living in base housing. Yeah, pack up your stuff. Nobody helped me to understand what a resume would really look like, uh, where I could transfer my my military skills into a civilian kind of thing. I had no idea what that was like. And then, okay, you have this this time. We'll pack up your base housing. Blah 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 blah. And here's your money back from Veep since you didn't go to college while you were in here. Okay. Here's your money back. Um, here's your severance. Uh, and we'll see you later. Thanks. Pretty much, yeah. See you, you later. Clear the base and see you later. I had a ten percent disability, as torn up as my leg was. Ten percent, ten percent, and they had given me the severance. And now, mind you, I re uh, if you remember from the beginning, I mentioned that I had a brother and sister that were Air Force. Right. Uh, both of them got out on disability. It's okay. crazy. My family last name, we probably can't even go in the Air Force no more. They pay us so much. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't take them. Don't take them, right? Oh, God. So, no, nah, it's a, a small sliver in the pie, probably, to be honest with you, though. It's it really awesome. is. It really Millions. is. Millions and of so dollars. And so when I, I got out, I had the 10%. I, I, I couldn't find a job that was going to sustain me and my family. It, it just things were really difficult. Um. I worked temporary jobs. I'm just, I, I really tried. Um, uh, I called my sister and um, I was like, I had called the VA and I was like, yo, I need some help. You need to increase my disability. My leg is not getting better. It's getting when did worse. You do that? When did like you do that? Maybe, maybe a year later. Okay. A year later, like 93. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to need some help. Da, da, da. My disability should be increased. The VA told me straight out, you got that $20,000 and and for disability severance. So you're probably not going to see any more money into your life. Support. At the time, I was like 28, 29. Right? Oh, gosh. You're not going to get any more money into your life. 40. They're not going to increase anything. What? What? So I called my sister. My sister said, don't fight the VA by yourself, honey. Just call the VA VA. Like what? I never heard of them. So yeah. I contacted the disabled American veteran, and since that day, they have represented me through all of this, through all of this, and they helped me to get uh, a higher rating. Um, but here's what the VA did: we'll give you this higher rating, this thirty percent, but you got to pay back that seven. Yeah. I've heard this before now. It's like the third or fourth time. So they took a hundred dollars out of my check every month for years until I paid back that twenty thousand yeah. dollars. Right, right. So, but what the thirty percent helped me to do was to go to college, do vocal right. rehab. 
There you go. So I was able to do that. So I did my undergrad from Volk Rehab. How'd you hear about Volk Rehab? How did you hear about that though? The DAV. There you go. Yeah. You got people got to reach out. You got to reach out. There are people willing to help. It's like, but you can't bury yourself too far in the in, mm -hmm. in dirt or snow and think you're going to get out because mm -hmm. you're not going to get out by yourself. So good for you for staying on it, staying active on that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I tell veterans now, don't don't do that fight by yourself. It's unnecessary. No. Nah. You know. And I and for a long time I thought the VA was just. I was like, how do you people sit here and just tell people no? We're suffering. This is, we're not just here. You're not taking the money out of your pocket. Why is this so difficult for you to see that people are, are literally virtually disabled and not able to do the things that they need to do? Whether it's physically, mentally, whatever. How, how do you, why do you make it so hard? I didn't understand that. But what I'm starting to see, what I started to see over the years is that a lot of people who work for the VA, and this is no, no shade toward the VA. Yeah. Um, first, first of all, I'm seeing less and less actual veterans who work at the VA. Fair enough. I'll, I'll go there. And I'll be like, "Oh, hey, are you a veteran?" No. <laughs> okay. Not that. Hey, no, no shade. Yeah. But I think a lot of people who worked at the VA. This is my personal experience. Um, they just didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah. So instead of saying, "Well, I don't know," let me check with somebody. Oh no, we don't do that. What? That's crazy. So the DAV, who thankfully is made up of all disabled veterans, they had already done the legwork and jumped through all the hoops and they knew which resources were available and which things and policies would apply to me and da da da. Um, so I was wearing a leg brace for years given by the VA and I had no idea about the clothing line. Clothing allowance, yeah. Cause I was the gonna, VA yeah. had never ever told me that. What? You what? It's like eight hundred dollars now. Yeah, like goes up like all the time. It goes year. up every year, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So they had the VA had never told me that, and I I really don't think that the VA that a lot of employees in the VA are just being ugly and withholding stuff. I think a lot of them just don't know. I, I really think that could be the case, or the or the VA itself's not looking like they're not they're not like a accepting everyone with open arms to write someone a blank check because at the end of the day, they're not going to try to pin everything together. I don't think, but you're right because I've heard people talk with their book rehab, book rehab counselors. And they say like, Oh, they didn't even know that was self-employment was available. You hear stuff like that. You're like, how are they in those positions? How, how, Sway? how yeah, are you like helping it. people? I don't yeah. Exactly. yeah, that's a yeah, that's a big one. And then turns a lot of people off, which it should, but it shouldn't make you give up. It should just make you, that's why, I don't know, it's like you almost got to know more than what the people know that you're going in to do something. Like before you go to vote, right. rehab, you can have it all ironed out so that, that they know you're squared away and you're not just right. going in there. Like me, I didn't really know what was fully available, but I had an idea. But it's like, oh, let me do the self-employment track. I got to know about that. And like this dude just tells you no. And you're like, well, I deserve a little bit better answer than no because this is available for me. If you have a business plan, if you're serious about something, you could call your congressman next because I've done that too. And it's not like to... It's just like you have to use like escalation of force, just like you would in a battlefield. But you know, absolutely, this is, a, this is a battlefield too. It doesn't matter. It's not it like we're is. a of war. It you are though. If people are not letting you get your benefits, or you're not getting the answer you deserve, or you're not getting, it absolutely you know, is. So you got to take something in your own hands at the end of the day. But you have you. to be your own best advocate. And and uh, no, yeah. I didn't know everything, and I I couldn't figure it all out. But I, I can ask questions. There and you so go. I encourage people, if you're getting out and they need to give you the information, and of course, if you don't have the information, you don't know you don't have it. So ask questions. You all have the internet now, honey. Listen, this you're is right. how old I am. You're right, though. You're right. Everything's you all can Google stuff and be like, well, what's available to me? I, I, we didn't have that. So it's that's so great for you all now that you can just go, no, that's that's not right. What you're telling me is it's incorrect, you know? Yeah. Um, so the other thing is um, when you're in the military and this, I, I, I'm sure hopefully uh, this, this applies now too, not just when I was in, if you're feeling ill or feeling sick or you got some, go, go, go to the clinic or go yeah. to the hospital, have those things documented. You actually act, actually, you really, really do need a paper trail at some point. That doesn't yeah. mean you have to go every day and whine. Oh, my back is hurting. No, that's not what that means. 
That means if you are having an actual problem, a physical problem, which is exacerbated by your service, which usually is, right. go and get it looked after. You need to look after you. Look after you. Take yeah. care of you. Yeah, because when we get out, when we're in, we're, we're all in this little boat together. You know, we're all on the same team. When, honey, when you become a civilian, nobody cares. Do you understand me? Yeah, they do not care. No. I don't care if you were in the military, Lisa. You are not special. <laughs> yeah. So you really have to take care of yourself. Go ahead. Stand up for yourself. Be open. Take notes. I used to always take notes for everything. Oh, my God. Document everything. Uh, dates, times, people you spoke to. I still do that. Do that today. When I call somebody on the phone, mm, what's your name? When I, I still do that today. But take care of yourself. You have to be your own best advocate. Your yeah, own best you. advocate. And yeah. so the good thing about bulk rehab, it, it, it did take care of my undergrad. Uh, I went to uh, Anderson University here in South Carolina. So I started uh, undergrad when I was 36 years old. Okay. Because the, by then you kind of figure out what it is you're going to do, right? Um, and uh, so the bulk rehab paid for school, the, the, the books, the tuition, the supplies. It was a really, really good thing. And it really, really helped me. And I went ahead and knocked school out, undergrad. And then um, I went to, I wanted to go to grad school. Um, back, back in the day, I don't know how bulk rehab is now. But when I went, they sent me to a psychologist to take this series of tests. Okay. These written tests. Um, and then they they compile all this information and then they tell the VA voc rehab person, well, yeah, this person would probably complete a degree. Because I was like, oh, I just want to make $35,000. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to do. They were like, yeah, she can make that kind of money, but not with a, a bachelor's degree, but she would be good for the program to have, you know, she would probably complete the program and get a bachelor's. So I was able to do that. And, and I, I was glad that I did it. I was absolutely glad that I did it. And then um, a few years later, after that, I went to grad school. Um, I have a master's degree in mental health counseling. Nice. So, <laughs> so. Then I went to work for the state and I did other things and all kinds of things like that. But in in the time that all of this is going on, my, um, I'm, I'm having health issues. Um, here's, I don't know if they would do this now, but when I got out, part of not only my, my knee, that was not the only disability. I actually have, oops, I'm sorry, I actually have uh, hypertension. Okay. Uh, I have hypertensive heart disease. My hypertensive heart disease was declared service connected. Okay. Um, so the other issues that happened to my health because of the hypertension, those were also service connected. You got like secondary to the, right. to the heart condition, right. right? To the heart, right. So I have other things. I have uh, your high blood pressure can affect your kidneys, um, all kinds of other things. So in um okay 99 through 2004 i finished undergrad 2008 i went to grad school finished in 2010 i was working and still dealing with the cva by then my disability rating had gone up uh i had had during that time uh hypertensive crises other things that were going on that were affecting my health um, so my rating increased over the years. So by the time I'm in grad school, right after grad school, my rating is like 90%, 90%. Okay. Uh, so going back and forth, I don't know, oh, no, we don't want to give you that other whatever. Okay. So in 2016, I was, uh, in 2016, I was at home one day getting ready to go to work and um, I get up and I'm like super, super dizzy. Just an insane kind of dizziness where I feel like I can't see my feet moving. It was just the weirdest thing. And so I sat on my porch uh, 
this is so weird. I'm so weird when it comes to like stressful things. I sat on my porch and I called 911 and I said, I think I'm having a stroke. Yeah. Now, mind you, I didn't get that, uh, the symptoms of stroke, like they say, on your left side, your speech is slurring, da, da, da. none of that. I just got super duper dizzy and felt like I wasn't in the world. Yeah. So I called I call 911. I'm sitting on the porch and the 911 operator goes, okay, somebody's going to come right now. And then, and then she goes, okay, uh, well, call me back if anything changes. Ma'am? <laughs> if anything changes, like, what, if I die? You want me to call you back? Girl, You're not saying, yeah, you what? <laughs> ain't you supposed to be on the phone with me? You playing. Set it out. So I called my son. I was like, yeah, I'm waiting on the ambulance. So I get to the hospital and they're like, well, we did the uh, the CAT scan and we don't see a bleed, but because of your symptoms, it's a rare kind of stroke that would be in the back of your brain. So we're going to do an MRI and see if that's what's going on. And that's what was going on. I had a stroke, stroke in the palm wow. in the back of my brain. Um, thankfully, uh, I did stay in the hospital for a few days. It resolved. Everything got taken care of. I have no residual effects from it. Um, if if I didn't tell you, you would never know I had a stroke. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after I got out the hospital, then then the VA goes, oh, you know what, girl? <laughs> we should have gave you that 100% three years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. And then they're like, yeah, they're we're going to you the back pay then. Oh yeah, the back pay. Because when I get the the back pay, I I see it in my bank account this money. I'm like, what? About but 60, even, about sixty thousand. Yeah, it was. You already know that the pay scale is public, so we know. Yeah, you know, let's, yeah, let's go. Yeah, it is. Hey, let's go. <laughs> so yeah. um, yeah, I got a letter from the DAV, um, saying yeah, they're gonna go ahead and and do your. 100% before I heard from the VA. That's crazy. They had inside. Yes. Yeah, they just it goes yeah. to show, like you said, that's why you work with those people like that, that are skilled and that, that are professionals and they're, that's what they're trained get to you do. So. A professional VSO, get you a professional, somebody who knows the little in the and out. Yeah, and you got it. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's what it. And that's what it is. I don't think it, like you're going back to the VA about how you were saying, like, you know, the people aren't really like there to do It's like, it's crazy. You talk to one person, they put the stuff in the notes, then they send it to somebody else that's never met you to make a decision on if they're what you're going to get. Then you might have interviewed right. somebody else that never even talked with them. That's a third party that did that did your um, C&P exam where you could be like me and sit on the line. Someone come on 30 minutes late and act like a total bitch. And then yeah. just tell them. Then you're like, I don't feel comfortable talking to you and having my, you have my, my C&P exam in your hands and you're coming on here just because you're a doctor all acting all crazy. I just right. she hung up. I had to reschedule, but guess what? I rescheduled. I waited a little longer, and that exam got me to one hundred percent permanent total. Too. Right. So sometimes you just right. gotta walk away or you something. Like that, uh, you know? Yeah, and you have to protect your peace because Seriously. this is not this is not a, a a battle for just a small thing. This is True. this is really gonna change your life. Life changing, Absolutely. and your kids, your kids, your family, your kids, oh, your, your it, everything. Yeah. It changes everything. Everything changes everything. And at the time when I got the hundred percent, and I had had the stroke, I was working in private practice. Okay. Um, but because of um, that's a really scary thing to happen. Let me just say that it's very, very scary because I thought I was gonna die. Right. And then after I had been fighting with the VA for so long for that 100%, and they kept saying, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden you give it to me. I was like, what y'all know that I don't know? Am I about to die? <laughs> oh, like, oh my gosh, it's crazy that you say that because guess what? My friend, we were talking about this. And it's like, you know why we get this this money, right? Because like it's for one per some one of my other people I talked to, they said it's like us it's like when you get a uh, service connection disability, like it's us su suing the US government for the mm -hmm. rest for the rest of our lives, right? Almost mm -hmm. if you want to put it in that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then someone else said, like, they're giving us that money because they expect you to die. Because they expect they expect this just like you just said, because like, oh shit. She just, she just went to the ER and had this, so maybe we should give it to her for the next 
she yeah. might have to make it another two days or something like that. You know, yeah. let, me, let me go ahead and give the hundred percent so it doesn't seem like we didn't do anything for her. But you're three weeks, you're three years late, or never mind that. If you had the all that, I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy. And it though. sounds crazy, but yeah, that no, really no, how no, I felt. Yeah. Yeah, but, I was like, hey, what? Y'all want to give it to me now? Just like, oh, here, here you go. Mm, what's up with y'all? Mm. So. I, I, I went ahead and re, um, retired from my job. I had to, you know, send my clients out to other therapists and do things like that. And, and then that year, so my last working day was December the 15th of 2016. Um, December the 25th, I was in Madrid, Spain. And after that, I just kept taking trips, right? And the therapist from the VA, she was like, oh, you canceled your appointment and you're on another trip. So I was like, yeah, you know how death comes around with the sickle in the hood and whatever. If yeah. I'm not home, you can't find me. So. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you on the move. Yeah, I, I don't think that the oh. death is, yeah. <laughs> She's not home. Let's keep moving. So yeah, I, I took eight trips that year. I went to Spain. I went to Cuba. I went to Vegas. I I, I took trips. I took trips. Yeah, you find yourself I, though. I, <laughs> I had my family. I took my um, family on trips and things like that. And and it was a very scary time, though. It was very scary for me. And so... Um, Why? Just to, did, you think gonna, did you just think you were going to pass? Because I really thought I was going to die. I yeah. really literally thought I was going to die. To the point, this is how much I thought I was going to die. And I'll share this with a lot of people. But uh, I, I'm an old lady. I still use checks. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> that's how good, I, will that's how good. I will write you a check, baby. I got a deposit in uh, mobile app, so it's all good. I'll take the check. Right, take a picture and keep moving. <laughs> so, um, but when I had first got the hundred percent and everything, and I had all that money in the account or whatever, I would write checks to my children. Write checks, yeah, and just put the um, amount just under ten thousand. So that if something happened to me, they could go get that money. Right. And a year after I had got the hundred percent, I'm going through my car and I open the console and I see the check because I really thought I was going to die. Yeah. So for the and one of my other disabilities, I'll, I'll say this really quickly. Um, yeah. Well, not really quickly because I'm a talker, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I um I have PTSD. And I had seen one of your previous episodes where you mentioned that. And you did say not to compare and contrast, but some people who have not been deployed um, have PTSD. You, absolutely. You absolutely. And, and it's true. Absolutely. And it's true. So my PTSD is from a military sexual trauma. Okay. Um, so having that and then all these other things compiled with the health issues, it was really very scary. It was very scary for me. So the PTSD along with that comes the anxiety and some depression and some other issues that were going on. And now you tell me, oh, by the way, you just had a stroke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say goodbye to your kids, your grandkids and all that stuff. And life as you know it, you know. Um, so a lot of that time was scary and it just uh, kind of compiled on to the mental health issues that were already there once I had the stroke. Those things just kind of, you know, got a little worse. How'd but, you get out of how'd you get out of it? What made you get out of it? Because um, obviously having that mindset is not that great for you. You probably figured that out along the way and just like what what helped you and what made you get out of that into, you know, onto the greener pastures, I suppose. Well, I don't know if they're greener pastures. But one thing I did realize with the VA is they love to medicate you if you say you have a med uh, mental illness. That's all Western medicine, though. It's not even just the VA. It's just it's the, not the just a, but the VA, the they, you know. they really do. And I need it. And here's the other thing. I don't know if yeah, other people, uh, ask your other veterans if they have experienced this. Um, I'm going to a VA therapist. This she was really good. But here's the thing. I The my opinion, my personal experience, is because I'm a therapist, there were certain things that she just expected me to know. This, yeah, I know about a book and I know about, but this this is pertaining to me, not one of my clients. Right. You know? 
Yeah. This is I need you to see me as a client, not as another therapist. Right. So that was a little issue. The other thing is you're a hundred percent or whatever your percentage is for your mental mental illness. Do you, I'm gonna ask you personally, do you feel comfortable talking to a VA therapist for real, for real? Or do you think that if you say certain things like, you know what, I've been feeling really good for the past four weeks. Do you think that that written into your mental health record will affect your rating? Has it yeah. crossed your mind? It, it, oh, I would say it possibly could. I mean, that's crossed my mind for a lot longer than right. just having the rating itself because I, you know, you, they, they take the note. It's like, it's a, almost like a game. It's crazy to put it in that perspective. But if you go in there and tell someone that you're doing amazing, everything you say in that session, it's going to go into your notes. You're going to have it, but you can go on your My Healthy Vet and look exactly what the, the notes were for that. I'm sure that right. has been around forever, but no, I mean, I would say, you know, when you talk to someone, I have the people I've had a run around with in the VA, I feel like they're, they've been pretty good. And I, you know, right. but I, but I had to go back for my mental health because one time I got a I got a fifty percent rating and then uh <clears throat> you know I thought I got time as time went on it got worse and then then you start hearing about people doing this and doing that and getting out of the military and doing all this I'm like well you know what I think I should you gotta go back if you think something gets worse don't just listen to everyone around you because they don't know if they haven't done it themselves so <clears throat> my condition got worse I went back and got a reevaluation and, and I got my disability upgraded but um. I guess you got to go in there and tell people what, I mean, what the first time I did, I had to start telling them about what was going on. Then they told me to stop, but then I only got a 50% rating. Well, maybe I should have kept going instead of you telling me to stop because maybe I left right. out the stuff that you needed to hear right. to put myself over what I need to be. Cause I'm not lying. I'm, I'm not trying to lie. I'm not, we're not on here telling no one right. to lie because everyone goes through whatever they went through in the military and absolutely right. You don't have to go to the war to have PTSD. You can have PTSD from having a car crash seeing your friend exactly. die. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Exactly. You have PTSD from coming from, it doesn't even matter. But yeah, so I guess it just depends on who you talk to, but don't sell yourself short, swallow the pride. And if someone even tells you that you can stop, if you have more to say, tell them, you know what, I say got more to, more to say, say because it. you might only get that one chance. You might not have, you might not want to go back. I mean, right. you might, you know, and even if you do have another chance, it's going to take more time than getting what's yours. I mean, it took me five years to get to 100%. What if I had 100% the day I left the army? And that right. was that's a, that's a difference of a quarter million dollars. Right, right, right. Put it in like a, and, the a, thing, and the thing with the mental health thing is because I, I want people, and I had to look at it for myself too, I want you to be okay. I want you to get the help you need. And so yeah. we have to go in there and be honest and tell it. That's true. You know, yeah. whatever she writes on there, or the, oh, she was feeling good today. If somebody's at the VA going, oh, she felt good for four months, let's lower her rating, then you're going to have to go back and fight again. But I need you, you, me, all of us, to go get the actual help that we need, to be right. open and honest and engaging. And, and if there's a therapist you're talking to and it's not a good fit, that doesn't mean that that's a bad therapist. It's just not a good fit for you. Ask for someone else. Yeah, that's Ask it. to be seen by someone else. That's, That's fine. True. Not everybody you talk, every doctor I go to, I don't really like them, right. but are they doing what's best for me? Even okay. if I, but if, if you, yeah, if you on some, mm, mm, yeah, I will tell the patient advocate, you are out of control. Okay. But <laughs> go and advocate for yourself by all means and get the help that you need. It's there. Reach out for resources. Like I said, you all have it. It's a little less challenging for y'all now because you yeah. do have uh, Google, you know, and you guys can connect and engage without ever even having to meet in person. That's that's amazing to me. Uh, that's true. That's I mean, we got, we, got, we got LinkedIn. They got, you know, YouTube. Yeah. You, got all, you got people, all types of veterans now doing podcasts. You got veterans doing, uh, you know, benefit TikTok videos. So it's like, yeah, right. it's all. It's all it's all like the everything's at your fingertips, but it's, it's your fingertips. Guess what? I was using it though. A lot of people are getting sucked down and not they're getting they're getting washed into watching Netflix or doing this, which is probably good. Yeah. Okay, it's cool to do, but not to binge every day because you right. gotta still you gotta still find value and and you gotta find who you are when you get out the military, or else you'll slip into that stuff like video games or 
stuff that's just really not going to be that productive. Or you might get right. a job that you're working for $12 an hour and you have to work 60 hours a week and you have no time to say to go to the VA because I can't miss work because I got to get paid. That's why you got to right. take care of yourself. Be proactive. Do all this stuff before you get out because no matter if you're doing four years or 30, you're still going to get out. So just take care of that's yourself. Right. The the that's day. right. What helped, right. what helped you get out of it all though? Like what made uh, you had all that stuff going bad for you, all that storm and stuff. And then like, what, what I helped you? I do have my family and I have some really good friends and just being practical. I'm a therapist for God's sake. I know how to tell people how to get it together. So can I change my thinking patterns? Can I change the way I'm thinking about things? Can I change what thoughts are coming to me when things are triggering me? And I have to be open and honest with myself and do the real work. That self-work is not easy, but it's necessary. And to have a really good support system around me where I can pick up the phone if I'm having a bad day and I can just hear somebody's voice. I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to listen. Yeah. So we need to have a really good support system. So my, my sons and my daughter-in-law, my grandkids, a really good support system for me. And then just doing things that I enjoy. I do enjoy. I still travel a lot. <laughs> you know? Got you. You love, we love I, I didn't travel. I didn't travel during the pandemic. I didn't fly for three years. Three years I didn't get on a plane because I was like the first time lit my hands are clapping. Somebody take off their mask and delay my flight. I'm gonna be on no fly list. I'm not having that. I'm not playing the game with you. <laughs> yeah, they'll take you off quick. Mm. Hey, I got, uh, you don't want no problems. Mm -hmm. nah, they're gonna be like, nah, see you, see you later, man. I'm gonna take your off. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're gonna be late. Gonna you're gonna be late for real. Yeah. I just stayed home. So I've been getting back out there and, and, and traveling more and doing things and, and seeing people and keeping myself busy. If you need help, talk to somebody. Unfortunately, my VA clinic that's here, um, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, there is a shortage of staff, medical providers. And so for me, I don't feel like I'm, I was getting the care that I used to get because I had this fabulous doctor for like 15 years. Oh my God, I loved him. But he left anyway. So, but they are, they are helpful in sending me to community care when I need it. You know, I'll, I'll just ask and they'll do that. So I appreciate that. Um, but just taking care of yourself and realizing and recognizing, okay, I need help because I can't figure this all out. That's okay. Right. Just be human. You're being human. Um, like I said, when I got out, I went straight into the military straight out of high school. That means I never had to write a resume. I never had to have a job interview except for some part-time fast food things that I had done yeah. during high school. But a real resume, a real job interview, I had no experience in that. And it it wasn't really there for us. And the VA, oh, my God, no. A disability rating when you get out? That would have been amazing. No, no, they didn't do any of that. So I appreciate the strides that the military has made in trying to take care of veterans before they become official veterans. Right. Um, but, again, Telling veterans, you have to be your own best advocate and stand up for yourself and ask the questions that you want to know. Ask. Yeah. Yeah, you got to. No one else is going to do it. And uh, the worst thing someone could do is not answer you or say no or the, the something yeah. you don't want to hear. But you really got to just sort of – I used to do that. I used to think that about all the time. Man, I wish, like, people would – you think something's just going to get delivered on your lap. It's not. You just got to go out it's there. And get after, you got to get after it. You know, when, it, when you want yeah. to go around you, find them. You want to get into a, a certain industry, ask. Now that, like, you know, they got a lot of different things, the Skills Bridge program or, like, Four Block or all these other, you know uh, – missions that they have for the veterans, you know, getting out of the service. So, which is nice because, you know, they got training with industry, you know, like you said, you just got a paper signed a couple of times and you were on your way. So I'm sure all, like, Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all, all the hundreds of thousands or whatever number of veterans that got out in this, in the same era that you did before they even made the strides to like, you know, the GI bill or post nine 11, they've, they've come a long way. Granted. Right. But, they have, know, they have, they really have. What, um, and I'm what, grateful for it. I'm yeah, grateful for the new veterans that are getting out that have that now. I'm absolutely, I'm grateful for them. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. You think, what, um, what do you wish you would have known? Obviously you said the VA rating and stuff like that, but like looking back on it or what would you say to someone that, that might've, 
went through what you went through or are still in the military before they get out, you know, what would you tell them? Modest things that you already hit on. Just ask the questions that you have because it really is a, a really, really, it's a, a huge shift to go from military to civilian. It's a big shift. It's a, it's a mind thing too. So ask the questions. Ask the questions. If you know someone who has, you served with who got out before you and they're, even if they're not doing fabulous, wonderful, ask them what it was like for them. Ask them what they would like to have known or, or so contact people that are, create you a circle, create right. a circle of support <laughs> with veterans who have gotten out before you and people who are still in with you to figure out what's going on, what you need to do. Cause it's a, it's a huge change. And I can't. I cannot imagine just coming out the military now, and and dealing with people. Here. Listen. <laughs> Listen. Well, that's why, lot, that's why a lot of veterans are like going to become entrepreneurs, even though it's not a lot. Because uh, the stats say, after World War One, it was like forty five percent of all small businesses were owned by entrepreneurs. Now we're at like four yeah. percent. By by that's forces. crazy. So more veterans, maybe y'all need to start a business. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, but I know you guys are used to hard work. You're used to long hours. You're used to, you know, like. And that's crazy because it doesn't help you. <laughs> but let's, that's another episode. But anyway, uh, yeah. yeah. Because we have the wherewithal, you right. know, Generation X. Somebody was like, "Where's Generation?" I have a TikTok, by the way. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw your link on your Facebook. Yeah, I was like, "Damn, she got a TikTok." I don't know what she got going on. Even, there you go. He's yeah. famous. It's not good. Baby. <laughs> so, hey, um, and the funny thing is, I have over three thousand followers on TikTok. They've never heard me speak. <laughs> Ever. There you go. That's crazy, right? You gotta, you gotta I, just, face, I, I just put pictures. Up. Just pictures on with music behind them. They're like, "Yay!" That's that's how TikTok is. <laughs> but <laughs> my thing you know. is, my my thing is, what whatever you're going to do, and and understand Generation X, my generation, we were you should be children should be seen and not heard, and we used to ride bikes, honey. From I I grew up in Compton. Yeah. I would ride my bike from Compton to Inglewood. Nobody knew where I was. <laughs> we didn't fail phones. Yeah. No, I'm not going back in the house to drink water. You got the hose. If I go back in the water, go back in the house, I've had to stay in the house. Yeah. And I, I do not hear people from Generation X saying I'm bored. Ever. No, even when I grew up, I mean, I got my first high. Uh, I got my first uh, cell phone in ninth grade. It was my mom's Nokia ninth old phone. Grade. But, when I, but when I grew up, but when I was growing up, even with that cell phone, we were still. I was. My whole high school years, we were always out playing sports, and like you, like my, I'd come home nine, ten o'clock at night sometimes. You know, come home from the YMCA, play basketball, or be out all day playing and stuff like that. Nowadays, you're right. absolutely right. But who's to blame, though? Is it the kids or is it the parents? I mean, and the that's kids, not even the point. Kids. Here's the point that I'm making: us, us who did that, who were such, we could take care of ourselves and problem solve and critical think. Yes, you can go start your own business. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You have great ideas you create. Nobody ever had to helicopter parent you. Nobody had to tell you where to go, when to do it. You figured it out. So you will figure this out too. Go ahead, start that business you can think about, honey. Right. Do it. Right. Yeah. Because we don't have those jobs anymore, those factory jobs where you could work from high school till you're 80 in the same job. Those don't exist anymore. So oh, start the business. Do the thing that you're passionate about. Absolutely. Time yeah. to change. Like if, you got to think about it. Like in that same generation, people were learned, people were taught how to go work somewhere and they'll have a 401k and a pension when they get done. Those, like you just said, that's gone. Or they, those are, those are, or they're going to get rid of you before you hit that time and say, we're going to bring in young Billy and he's 21 and, and get him. Because I don't want to money. pay you. Of course. So, right. you, so a, a business is just, a, just isn't for like a, uh, to make mi millions. No, it's actually a tax strategy. It's also like a, a, it's it's also something totally different that you could you could benefit a lot of different ways from if you just Absolutely. actually figure out what it is and you get around the right people. You know, a lawyer, accountants, you know, uh, all that stuff like that. You know, but there's free resources out there for us veterans because there's all stuff like Veterati or uh, the IVMF through Syracuse. They have stuff for vet people that want to become entrepreneurs because nice. there's money money available there's all types of nice. stuff available so you know but hey nice. 
I would say you have to take me through Compton on the bike one time, but I don't know if I'd make it out. <laughs> I, I, got, I got a Dodgers hat. I mean, I got. Hold on. That's not going to help you. Hold on, hold, on, hold, on a I got, hold on a second. I got to get this hat, though. I got to show you something I got in the mail. You'd actually appreciate it. Yeah, it would help me. I'm with you. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm good now. What's up? I can't see. Is that like Raiders? Yeah, that's the old school I'm Raiders. I'm scared of you. I am scared of you. Oh my God, you are a hot man. <laughs> I can lie to you. I'm about to plug my own. I'm about to plug my own uh, my own business. But I sell clothes and I sell hats and stuff like this. That's just, and I got this in the mail today. This is like a couple hundred dollar hat, probably because it's uh, yeah, yeah, like that, that Easy E war. You know, they yes. love that. So it's not the black um, one, it's not the wool one, but that's like a '90s or '80s sports specialties hat. So you know, I'm I like good. it. I'm good in it. I'm good. With, I'm good with you out there. I'll be out there with you. I'm going to Inglewood in August. So um, you a Paul Pierce fan? A what? You Paul Pierce fan? He's from mm -hmm. LA. Basketball player. He played for the Celtics. I don't follow sports uh, at all, darling. No, no. not at all. No. Um, but I'm going because I went to Morningside High School in Inglewood, and they're having a reunion picnic, so I'm going to go. So I just recently found that there's this wonderful mural on La Brea. Uh, it has, uh, like, Dr. Dre, Easy e when they were, like, really young, and they're all wearing the different baseball caps. Yeah. So I'm going to make my way over there on La Brea to take a picture in front of that wall mural. There you go. So I love to see street art. I love street art. <laughs> So I will travel for art and food. <laughs> Miami's pretty good for that. Miami has good uh, Winwood uh, Winwood walls, and they got a lot of street art, and they got good food there. So, yeah, Cuba does too. Wonderful street art in Cuba. Yeah, yeah. Like living mm -hmm. back in the days, they got all the old cars and stuff like that. You know, like yeah, the they do. It's so crazy because I'm like, where are you guys getting parts for those to keep them running? It's amazing. It's hey. Amazing. What was your favorite place that you got to see when you're in the military? What was your favorite like duty station? Did you have anywhere good? Wait a minute, let me tell you something. <laughs> no, no. Did you, all, you only were at you only, you only never took you anywhere to school or nothing like that. You're only in New Jersey and, and, and I went to New Jersey. That was it. I think I, yeah, they sent me back to uh, school, but back in Texas because we do uh, tech school and basic in Texas. Okay. I think I went to an NCO class in Texas or something, but I never. Never went overseas until I got out the military. Really? That's crazy, right? But we were doing peace time. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's all well, good. So. so, yeah, I never went overseas until I got out of the military. Yeah. That's all good. I went yeah. to New York City a lot. I did New York City a lot and Philly and Delaware, and I, I did a lot of things, honey. That's yeah. not bad. I mean, you're <laughs> You're the big apple, so you're good to go. That's not I, bad. I, I did a lot of things. I did a lot of things in Brooklyn, but yeah. <laughs> so, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn yeah, out there. Yeah. So, uh, what would you say your military service in one word? If you had to describe it, what would you what would you say? One word? Come on, yeah. Mike. One Come word. On. Uh, interesting. There you go. I mean, and I, I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. I learned a lot of things, learned a lot of things about myself, um, about the world around me and how I fit in that world. Um, it showed me that I could do things, get through things, get over things that it showed me my own inner strength, my own inner strength. It does. So, okay. It does do that. You got anything else that you want to put out there before we sign off for the day? Um, just take care of yourself take care of each other and whatever it is you are going through whatever it is you're going through I need you to remember that you're still here so that means you have a really good track record so remember that okay and remember that you're gonna be okay yeah uh, okay appreciate you sharing that you got any of your old battle buddies that you want to call out on here that you could have them come and share their story that you still got contact with who you got my girl Kelly she knows who she is and a good friend of mine Jennifer Chief Jennifer she knows who she is my good friend Tara that I'm going to see uh in Inglewood always up to no good Tara Marshall 
Um, and Alice, Alchemy, better known as Wendy. She knows who she is. Um, and also, <laughs> also the ladies that I just went and met, I, um, I'm i part of a women's upstate group. So uh, I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I just was awarded a, a Quilt of Valor. I did see that. I watched it. Congratulations on that. I saw the I saw thank the little you. video that you posted. Yeah, thank you. So I was so honored for that. So I think a lot of those ladies who were there at that program and who are with me in the women's upstate group, ladies, please come and share your story. Please come and share. We're waiting to hear this it. Great experience. This is a great experience. I love it. Hey, we're thank waiting you. to hear it. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing and everyone for listening in today. You heard it from Lisa, you know, have a plan, be ready. And I appreciate you sharing. Thanks, everybody, for listening in and have a blessed day. Thanks. Uh, hey, if you guys want to, if you know a veteran or you're a veteran yourself, you know, tune in, Real 1%, reach out, leave a comment, or and let me know you want to share your uh, story so we can get you on here one day. So thank you guys again. Have a blessed one.